Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever in the world you are. We were just making a joke before saying that March lasted like two years and April like two days. I, we don't know what, what uh, time is. The time is, uh, we don't even know what day of the week it is anymore. I don't know if you have the same perception of time these days. Things, you know, some days seem to be moving really slow and some other, uh, some other days or weeks seem to be moving very, very quick. So... It is great to have you again with us, and please let us know where in the world you are connecting from. I got to say, this is the first time of all the many, many LinkedIn Live sessions that I have done throughout the past uh, almost one year since I, I, I was unable to do LinkedIn Live sessions, that I do this on the Hacking HR page. So I am hoping that there is a lot of interaction and you know great conversations not only with the panel but also among yourselves so please put in the chat where in the world you're connecting from and if there's anything else that you want to share with the audience or with the panelists please make sure that you're posting it in there so that we bring that back to the panel or that you engage with others in the conversation it is of course quite a privilege and an honor to have once again in this conversation lisa braid bushan and chris we started this conversation on April 9th. The title of the conversation was The New Work Order, and we were thinking about how the world of work and life in general could look like after coronavirus. So it's been one month, and because this, because time is so strange right now for everybody, so many things have happened in one month. So my first question to the panel, and I think, you know, to all the panel, will be, what do you think has changed in the past month that makes you think that the future could be a little different from what you had envisioned one month before? Anybody wants to jump into yeah, the I'll, question? I'll start. Chris, go ahead. Yes. Hi there. Course, it's nice to have the band back together. I don't know how many people were on last time, but we had a good time last time. I don't know whether the audience did or not, but we did. So <laughs> it's nice to have everybody back together. Um, I think this month has been extraordinary in that uh, a month ago, we were all talking about how to deal with the, the beginning of the crisis, you know, how and when we could get people back to work. And listen, that's still very tactically there. But every company I know has been shocked at what they've been able to do in this unique environment. And Nobody wants to go back to the way it was. The one, of the, one of the really mysterious questions, I think, for big businesses for the past you know, 10 years has been, nobody was really happy with the operating model. Everybody knew we were too hierarchical, too siloed, not agile enough, didn't empower people enough, um, but we didn't, we didn't tackle it aggressively enough, enough places. And the only explanation I can come up with that for is inertia. Why do it on Wednesday? It was fine, you know, it was basically fine on Tuesday, it'll be fine on Thursday. Except now everything's changed. We call it the great unfreezing. And I think every business that we talk to is, say, is saying, what do we keep from uh, this set of experiments? What do we throw out from this set of experiments? But I think there's gonna be a real difference in winners and losers in terms of who just lets things go back to the way they were and who really grasps this moment and says, we're going to make some bold changes uh, to lock this in. Awesome, Chris, thank you. I can add on to that. Oh, go ahead, Lisa, and then we'll, I'll go. Sorry. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I've been really proud of, and, and I had the opportunity earlier this week to um, engage with Kat Cole, who is the president and COO of Focus Brands, very, very heavy franchisee business with like Cinnabons and, and things like that. And we got into the conversation around hourly workers and essential workers. And one of the things that I think has been similar to what Chris was just saying, so incredible is the movement to the importance of these essential workers. You know, in many of our organizations, these are the lowest paid employees. They're the people who maybe aren't getting all of the wonderful perks and things that, that leaders get. And to see that dynamic shift now, as these are the people that are on the front lines continuing to put their health and safety you know, at risk every day. They're the ones that are continuing to make our brand exceptional with the level of customer service that they're providing. My hope is that as we transition back 
into work and into the, the new kind of shifting that, that Chris just referenced, that we look at that population of workers really, really differently. And we think about ways to recognize the contributions that they've made during this challenging time, um, to think about how we compensate them in a new world and, and really just what that experience looks like for those people who have kept our businesses afloat, who maybe didn't get very much recognition um, and acknowledgement for their contributions pre-COVID. Awesome, Lisa, thank you. So I'm gonna talk about the dark side a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I mean, I think, look, there's been a ton in terms of bringing your whole human to work, thinking about community. You know, a lot of us are not being heroes. We're reaching out to our community and everything else. But I will tell you, there's a, there's a real issue because of the childcare situation. Um, I have people across my business, people I know personally, people are cracking right now because they don't, we, there's no real alternative in terms of how we get through this. Schools are not gonna come back online. Um, all parents are going through an experience now where everything's getting canceled in the summer. And I think everybody's done the best they could over this time period to figure out how to work in this environment, kind of thinking that this would be a temporary sort of moment in time. Um, we have a real gender equity issue on our hands as we go forward um, with this. Uh, I'm talking to groups that are thinking about how do we think about spinning up childcare again. Childcare's model is really challenging because it's many in a group and given what we're dealing with with the coronavirus, that may not be the solution we can do safely. Um, you know, creating bubbles, all those kinds of things. But I, I would just say that this issue, particularly for women in the workforce, you know, look at how many women are publishing papers versus men, et cetera, et cetera. I can give all kinds of examples. Um, this, this will be a crisis situation for us at some point in terms of how we take care of our, you know, women across the board uh, in terms of the workplace. Yeah, and I would agree, Britt. I would say the current model is not sustainable. While we have experienced the positives that, that Chris and Lisa echoed, I worry about communities and young people. And what I mean by that is just because I can access the best talent if I'm a, if I'm a bank in Cleveland doesn't mean I should create a virtual COE of the best tech and data talent and kind of give up on the local community colleges or, or think about the employability of my young people, maybe whose parents have been laid off of the 33 million that have been laid off in this country. And then I think about young people. You think about wage compression coming into the workforce now, whether you're from Ivy League or from a community college. But think about when we started in the workplace. We did our best learning face to face with people. We, we, we grazed our knee, we learned, we made mistakes, etc. How do we onboard young people into all of our firms? How do the business leaders on this call kind of advise their, their organizations on how they do that? And so that's really hard to do for the next 18 months in a digital way. And we talk about some work will be remote forever. While that's great for flexibility and you should have that choice, there's going to be a struggle for different demographics. But I think that, and we'll get into this, but there's, a, there's some benefits that we need to think about right now. There's some things that may be benefits in the future. We're in this messy transition, and we've just got to make sure we don't make decisions that we cannot untangle the impact, communities, demographics, um, females in the workforce, et cetera. Well, it seems that a lot of things have changed and, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of challenges have come up, uh, you know, over the past uh, one month, but also like Chris said at the beginning, many organizations have done what they thought was unthinkable for them to do in such a short period of time to stay operating and, and, you know, I don't know if thriving would be the word, but at least, you know, surviving uh, the days of this crisis. When we had the conversation before, we separated our, our talk in sort of three big buckets, right? One was about mindset, and we included leadership in there. The other one was about infrastructure, about changing processes, and the other one was about technology. I, I want to ask you, over the past couple of months since this crisis started here, at least in America, and in many other countries, of course, it, it hit before, but at least here in the United States, it's been over the, couple of, the past couple of months that we've been in lockdown or like stay at home orders, people working from home. And there have been exceptional cases of leadership doing the right thing. I just saw a couple of days ago, the founder and CEO of Airbnb sending a heartfelt, painful, full of love letter to his people about the decisions that they needed to make to keep the company operating, laying off 25% of the workforce. But I've also seen the, the other side of the coin, if you will, with uh, you know, some leaders doing 
you know, pretty bad and nasty stuff, you know, for the, I'm not talking about, you know, politics, I'm talking about business leaders uh, doing the wrong thing. So if you were to say out of the one, the one month that has passed since we had the first conversation, what sort of qualities have you seen emerging in the leaders that are doing the right thing during this crisis? What things do you think are, you know, worth sort of like bringing up to the table and saying, those are the things that we need to be replicating, not only in the months to come as we are within this crisis, but in the future, when, once we get out of this. Well, I'll, I'll start real quick. At, and mine, mine's really simple. I mean, I've seen a couple of, of references where the CEO now is being referred to as the chief empathy officer instead of the chief executive officer. And I, I can honestly say after reading that message from Airbnb CEO, that demonstrated empathy and compassion at a whole new level. And, and I think that, you know, we, we look for CEOs and executive leaders who understand the business and who understand the financial elements and how the company makes money and all these wonderful things. I think in a future world, you're gonna be looking for far more compassionate and empathetic people as well. Not that we didn't look for that now, but you're, you're seeing demonstrated day in, day in and day out to your point, Enrique, that the people who are getting it right and the leaders who are not getting it right. And you know those have long-lasting impacts on brand and, and customer loyalty and, and employee loyalty. Um, I, I think you're going to start to see more emphasis put on that human side versus just the you know the the experience and the the operational elements of running a business. And I would add to that the leaders who and we talked about this a little bit about the power of expertise and the importance of it. The leaders who are trying to solve it with other constituents. So many of our CEOs of our clients are coming together in forums where they're. They're saying, how do we figure this out? Whether it's return to the workplace, whether it's how do we improve well-being for our people, this is not a competitive advantage anymore. This is a this is the biggest societal issue that we've faced um, in our working lives. And I think a lot more people are just trying to like solve it with all of the stakeholders in their communities, including the competitors. Yeah, I'd add authenticity. I think the leaders that can be unscripted, uh, the I don't knows right at the moment, but here's when we're going to next check in. Um, being really thoughtful about um, just being who you are. Uh, you know, I love a leader that can be able to go out on Slack and say, ask me your questions, and they don't send them all to a communications person to sweeten them up. Um, they just are, you know, you can see them typing and responding. Um, I just think that ability to kind of live in the moment and not hide behind the shields that so many of them have had in terms of comms folks and everything else it doesn't mean that the comms folks aren't still really important but leaders are going to have to be themselves in this moment well and, and, and this this is you know the kind of closing of the chapter on that trend which is we all knew that that kind of communication worked best uh it's mandatory in, in, in today's world because when things get important and we're all used to dealing with each other openly on social media like this, pe people expect that. And if they don't get it, it's deeply unsatisfying. I'd like to throw one other list on, on but also for CHROs, which is prioritization. Uh, there's so much going on right now, and picking your spots is, is critical. And you know, at the top of the list has to be keeping people safe and recovering from this. As, as Bujan said, this is the you know social challenge of, of, of our time. When you're thinking about business uh, needs, uh, that now has you know has limitations on it. And so, what are the things that really matter in business? Uh, and I, I would put a couple of things at the top of the list. One is revenue recovery. We all talk about getting back to work normal. Um, the biggest change for a lot of companies is demand reduction. And boy, you know, you got 50% of the revenues, a whole thing's, a list of things have to change. So I would prioritize how quickly can I. Chris, we're losing you in there. Chris, can you hear us? I think that's frozen. I think, uh, can yeah. you keep frozen? He's frozen, I mean, right? Just, yeah, he's frozen. I think we'll come back. I mean, just to extend his point, I mean, there's it's sectors exactly that may not recover. Or maybe areas. in some cases, 120% of red. We're not laughing at you, Chris, by the way. We, you just got frozen and Bushan started speaking and then you suddenly showed up again. <laughs> I think he's frozen again. Yeah. 
revenue right. recovery, demand, I mean, different sectors impacted. I mean, that's a, that's a big issue. It's not, there's no one size fits all playbook here. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. You know, I, I, I want to go back. I, I think I hope uh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris connects again. I, I want to go back to, to this idea of leadership being, being more human and authentic these days. And I, I'm sure you, you have seen it, you know, CEOs doing town halls, uh, you know, on Zoom calls, connecting, connecting from their bathroom because it's the only place in their house where they can do this. Or, you know, when they have their children in their hands uh, or, their, or their pets going around, so we are seeing one, one thing that was not new, but is emerging with more power right now, which is the, not only authenticity, but also humanity from these leaders, sort of showcasing themselves or showing themselves as the humans they are and empowering others to show themselves as humans as well, to feel, to show their families, to be, you know, even if they, you know, they want to show part of their family when they are in this call. So I think that's been a very, very positive trend. One thing that I, that I have heard over the past few weeks is this crisis being sort of a normalizing or leveling experience for many companies, meaning we, most of the companies, especially small to medium-sized ones, are starting from sort of the same place. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty for a lot of companies. They don't know how to operate uh, or they didn't know how to operate in a crisis like this. So basically everybody will is, is sort of starting from a very similar place, if you will. What do you think will determine the difference between the companies that will be able to weather the crisis and continue operating going forward and the companies that will, like you know, uh, Chris was saying before, will lose this, this fight and you know, either go bankrupt or, or you know, shut down their operations temporarily or whatever it is? What do you think the difference, not only in their operating models, but also thinking about you know, their leadership and whatnot, what do you think will determine which ones continue operating and thrive and which ones barely survive or die? Yeah, maybe I'll start. I mean, I think business models are the first place to start. So we've seen certain business models really get tested now. So what does this mean to the ride sharing industry um, and the sharing economy and the, and the role of gig workers? What does it mean to retail malls when we're not comfortable as a public to kind of go there in highly populated areas? So, I think certain sectors have been more heavily impacted and, and have to think about different revenue streams. I would just challenge, challenge you, Enrique, my dear friend, around the, this being a leveler. It's not a leveler. There, is, there are many small businesses that are struggling to make payroll that get impacted, the local bodega or the deli, and then there are huge corporates that, can, that have grown and are kind of real winners. So we talked about inequality at the human, at the workforce, at the community level, earlier in this conversation, there's a huge inequality for, for firms based on size and sector, which, which again is a big leadership role, but also gets into the world of, of policy, which I know we're not, gonna, we're not gonna get into here, but every HR leader on this call lives in the world of their business, their policy makers, their community. So I do think it's important for the HR leaders here to be advising their boards and their leaders around those topics. Awesome, thank you, Bushan. I agree. And I would, I would add to that too, you know, that I think you're right. The operating model has changed and that the businesses that I'm seeing flourish both small and large in my local community and globally are the ones who have pivoted. They've, they haven't necessarily completely scaled back. In some instances they've reinvested and they've pivoted their business model and gone and done additional investments in areas where they know there is acceleration opportunity for growth versus just taking the, we're going to scale back. Now, obviously that's, that's in some instances, that's the only thing they can do. You can't pivot to a totally different business model on a dime when you're a small business or, or something like that. But I, I do think those organizations who are having the greatest success are the ones that are finding ways to reinvent and reinvest right now in their people, their product, their service, their business models, and they're having some success. And it's sometimes hard to talk about the wonderful things. Like every time I start a Zoom meeting and somebody says, how are you doing? And I'm like, fabulous. I almost pause for a minute and say, should I actually be excited that I'm feeling great and things because so many others aren't. It's the same way with our businesses. We can't be apologetic because ones are having success or we continue to be successful. But to your point, Bushan, there, there's a grave inequality right now in that opportunity for people and organizations to continue to be successful. 
and organizations are making hard choices about how they're keeping their people or not. Absolutely. Um, and I would say, you know, cash is king in these moments. Obviously, you know, I kind of run in the VC circles and, you know, where people are funded, they're kind of pre-IPO in those kinds of stages. Everybody's thinking about cash burn. Everybody's thinking about what that means. You know, we, we caught this, you know, certain companies, obviously merit happened earlier for some and not for others. That's a big spend. If you think about all the things related to people cost, um, it's a big part of how every company is thinking about things. And I'll be honest, you know, I'm starting to decide who I buy. You know, I can give you my list of favorite vendors because of how they're treating their people. Are they keeping them on? How are they thinking about, you know, furlough? Are they taking care of their benefits? So many companies are self-insured, so they have the opportunity to really decide how they're going to do the work of, you know, setting up a furlough program or something else. Admittedly, a lot of folks can't make it all work given kind of cash spend. Um, but I think people are going to have a long memory about how they're treated in this moment. Um, how, you know, do they get a letter like they got from Airbnb or do they get put on a phone call where they're dismissed um, in a group Zoom? Um, and then, you know, there's also then the consumer side of this, which is looking at, you know, all of these groups now that are somewhat predatory, making money off restaurants and takeout and other things. I just, I think the world's going to become very interested in how people are treating their people, um, what they're doing if they have to make decisions to make changes, and how they're being really honest with their folks about how they're going to sustain it and how they're going to make, even if they keep their people on, how they're going to make choices um, in terms of where they spend their money right at this moment. That is fantastic, Britt. And, and you know, part of the conversation these days have been this crisis being the defining employer brand moment for a lot of organizations because whatever you do today will be remembered. And, uh, and I think we're going to look back not only through the crisis, but also, you know, next year, two years from now, we're going to look back and like you said, Britt, you know, look at those companies that did the right thing to sort of weather the crisis, to treat their people with humanity. We were having a conversation yesterday with Steve Farber. You know, he, he wrote the book, uh, Love is Just a Good Business. And he was saying, love is not sort of avoiding having to lay somebody off. Because if you don't do that, then your business doesn't work, right? Love is doing, making tough so choices, keeping high standards, but do everything that you do with kindness. Uh, because we know that many organizations like Airbnb laying off 25% of their people. I don't think that was easy for anybody. I just think they did it with the kindness and love that has sort of, uh, you know, defined the company and, 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 and what it is. So, so I, I, to, I, I love what you're saying. Um, uh, Brain about this. Yeah. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry, everybody. You know, we're all more understanding of each other than we used to be. Right. Thank you for the, the patience. Hey, I want to point out that that caring is not just a matter of style. It's a matter of its substance. Yeah. Um, one thing we did that I'm very, very proud of is we partnered with Eightfold AI and built something called Talent Exchange. I think Accenture did something similar. But we knew we had clients who were laying off and furloughing people. We also knew we had clients who had demand. And right now, there's uh, close to a million job opportunities that have either been filled or are open on talent exchange. And listen, that doesn't solve the unemployment problem in this country, but it's not a drop in the bucket either. And that's not something we've tried to offer as a service or charge for. You know, it was, it was actually pretty easy given some of our other analytics to set up. But just the companies who choose to participate are caring in a really material way that helps people, you know, maintain their livelihood. Yeah, I'd, I'd put a couple other ones on the list. Um, Silver Linings is local to Seattle and has been sort of Madrona recruiting bandwidth driven. And the one you're talking about, Accenture, ServiceNow, one of our board members is the CHRO from ServiceNow. And I believe there's one more group that all went in to do that. I, I think we should start cataloging all of those offerings um, and making them available to our HR friends. That is fantastic. Th th thank, you, thank you for sharing that. And, and for everybody who's watching right now, I know you got a, a bunch of questions. I'm trying to write some of them down, uh, you know, without going a little crazy because there's a lot of uh, stuff going on in the chat. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to bring some of those questions to the panel. Some of them are, are, are very tactical. One of them I think is really, really interesting. You know the story of Winston Churchill in, uh, in the Second World War. He always lost, 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 lost until the war started happening. And then he won. 
And then after the war, he lost. So what happened was there was some kind of leadership for, 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 for a war time, and there was some kind of leadership for peace time. So the question here is, do you think that all these changes, mindset changes that we're seeing right now, people carry more in, in style and substance, like Chris said before, people being more understanding, more tolerant, helping each other out. Do you think that is a permanent mindset shift or do you think it is a crisis mindset temporary shift that will go back to normal, which is really scary if it goes back to normal after the crisis? What, what are your th thoughts on that? Well, I'll jump in. I, I, think, I think you're going to see all kinds of different examples. There's going to be those who this, ha this was in some way, shape or form the way they behaved even pre-crisis and it's only, their, their behavior has only been exasperated either positively or, or negatively. I think there are people who, as we talked earlier and Bouchon was, was referencing this, they, you know, they're, they're pivoting, they're, they're moving their models, they're thinking differently and we're going to see heavy investment in new behaviors, new models, new thought processes in a new world, um, and then you're going to have some that are are kind of in between, where you know they they may not take a lot of what they've seen be good, but you know maybe they don't go back to some of the things that they were doing earlier. But those that are going to be the the most successful, as as we talked about earlier, the ones that are going to to make these shifts and stay the course with the the new world that's in front of us. Some of these, some of these, and I think we mentioned this. Some, some of these are just good, ta good traits that we always wanted to have. We always wanted humility. We wanted empathy. We wanted to put well-being on the agenda of every employee and every leader, and that's good. Yeah, necessity is the mother of of all create of all kind of necessity. Like this situation, this crisis has driven necessity in, in management. So that's good. What we need to think about is what are these bits are going to continue, and what external pressures are going to drive that. So. The investor community, if they start calling out leaders who are not transparent and are not humble and are not talking about all aspects of stakeholders like the community and the environment, that will, that will tell us if it's a more permanent change. So I think it's been, I think it's good. I would give us a B plus, but for it to be sustainable, <laughs> we need to think about some external pressures. And let me connect that, that what you're saying, Bushan, with a question that was asked here. And it is the caring from large companies to smaller companies. Britt, you also touched a little bit on that. Because it's not just leadership inward to, uh, inwards to the company. It's also that kind of leadership, leadership that says, I'm not going to buy from any company that is not treating their people with humanity, with love, with care. How, what do you think could be the recommendations for, uh, for uh, leaders maybe especially in HR from large companies when it comes to the way they, they deal with their providers from smaller companies, uh, whether it is talent providers or any other service providers. Any, any advice on that end? And that was a question from the audience. Yeah, look, I just want to work with people that are progressive, innovative, and, and you know, treat their people well. I think you know, part of that's partnership, right? So I don't know that that's necessarily going to change. Um, but I think about the things I've invested in over the last couple months, and it's been interesting to Bouchon's perspective. I, I probably wouldn't have gotten my mental health um, app that I'm going to launch next month in if it hadn't been in this moment and we thought about the long-term partnership with them. I wouldn't have had an antibody testing group that I worked with to think about, you know, how do I do telehealth with my folks in a different sort of way? You know, we already have telehealth, but how do we accelerate that? you know, so that we have both. So I think um, vendors are gonna be very interesting for HR leaders because we're gonna be looking at what helps us return to the office safely, keep people working from home safely, um, and doing all the things to know that we're supporting people through. So what I would say, Enrique, is, you know, it's not only working with vendors that have the same kind of vibe that you wanna have and the way you wanna be, um, but also I think the list of who's gonna be top of mind for me over the next six to 12 months is gonna be very different to get me through um, what I know is gonna be a different time here. Absolutely. Um, this is a this is a comment that came up in the in the uh, chat as well. I'm seeing I don't know if you have the same perception a different different behaviors in terms of how companies continue operating between what happened in 2008 and 2009 with what's happening right now. I'm seeing more humanity. Not 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 this is not a general thing. Not all the companies are being human, but I'm seeing more humanity. I'm seeing more love, more care, more. Uh, you know, uh, authenticity from leaders as opposed to the recession in 2008. So we know that love and caring is the way 
people are delivering tough messages and making hard decisions. But what do you think changed now vis-a-vis -vis 2008? What do you think is different today when we are in this economic, uh, you know, uh, complex situation, uh, probably way more complex than it was back in 2008, because now there are 30 million people, almost 30 million people unemployed, and the, the numbers will probably continue to rise. What do you think changed? And that one thing that changed, how can we make it sustainable for the world post-COVID? I'll just add two quick points. The shared experience we're all in makes it somewhat humanizing and consistent. Once these separation, these stay in order, um, stay in place orders start opening up and different parts of the country open up and people start going to restaurants and some people stay at home and their offices are closed, we don't have the shared experience anymore. It means it's more complex to manage. And I think that's the bit, that's part of the piece we have to watch. The other piece is, there's certain businesses that emerged so much stronger out of the financial crisis. Um, the banks, they capital, they, they held capital, they changed their culture. The banks are now seen as the, the good transmission vehicle for a lot of small businesses to get their PPP, kind of notwithstanding some of the challenges they've had around technology. So, so the point is that the shared experience is, is good. We've got to kind of watch that. And I think what we've got to learn from the crisis is there's going to be firms that are going to emerge strong. Chris mentioned this before, before he jumped off, uh, and that we've, we've got to kind of watch that. But we've got to also say, if we have a commitment to small business in this country, PPP aside and the loan forgiveness aside, how do we actually create opportunities for, for the 33 million who are unemployed? How do we create opportunities for new immigrants, for people from lower socioeconomic situations, for caregivers, as, as Britt was mentioning? I think that's our challenge of how we keep small business running and drive up the consumer demands. I think there's some very, very different pieces to this, this time around. Yeah, I would say, so I got to quote my CEO, Raj Singh, who said, actually before this crisis in December, right as I was starting, you can't change the world without love. Yeah. And I will just, I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, and I think that's going to prove itself. Is it safer now for CEOs to come out and actually talk about love? I think they were, I think there were a lot of them that were. I think it's become safer. I think it's become expected given the shared experience we just talked about. And I think those that can continue to talk about that um, will, will continue to change the world. The leader that I love um, is the, the gentleman that runs the World Central Kitchen, um, who is going out and feeding folks, putting restaurant workers to work, um, thinking about how to you know, put acts in place so that we can move restaurant supplies to you know, other supplies to feed folks. I think the moments of innovation will actually also be about love too. Yeah, I, I find this question very uh, difficult to think through intellectually. I'd like to go back pre-crisis a little bit and, and think about the topic of purpose in, in, in corporation. And having done a lot of interviews uh, of companies, simplistically, I would say there were three categories of executives. There were executives who uh, believed that their company stood for something broader in the world. There were executives who said, I might believe that, I might prefer that, but I, but I can't. My job is to produce shareholder value, right? So those are pretty diametrically opposite. And there were a group in the middle who said, yeah, both of those things can be true because if I don't stand for something, I won't get the right talent and maybe not the right customers and I won't generate maximum shareholder value. I'm not going to argue any of those people are right or wrong. I think they're all intellectually defensible positions. Um, however, if what Britt's saying is true, um, I think the thing has changed is we've all realized how interconnected we are. That is it that as employees, we may demand more from our employers. As consumers, we may choose who we buy from more. And by the way, if our entire, you know, if we've got huge unemployment, all of demand for all of our products and services goes down. So maybe we all are in this a little bit together. So to me, the interconnectedness is, is what's changing. But, but I have to come back to where I was before. I, I'm not sure I expect a broad societal response to last. I expect there to be winners and losers. And one of the, one of the stories I think it's easy to brush over is, you know, we're more and more in a winner-take-all economy. That, you know, the, all the economic profit is generated by a very few firms, right? 
And increasingly, they're firms that stand for something. But it's not just about caring. It's about a lot of other things they do in management to focus on their value agenda, to have a healthy culture, to run their business well from a, a performance and health standpoint. You, you could be a very caring business and run yourself lousy and not make any money. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to, uh, Chris, that's such an important uh, point. And I'm going to connect that to, to my next question. Of course, part of the conversation of, that we're having today, which is the world of work post-COVID. And it is this concept of reopening the economy. And, you know, the economy changes all the time and has changed dramatically over the past couple of months. And when I hear the words reopen the economy, it sounds to me as if we want to go back to what we had three months ago. You know, restaurants open. And I was just having a conversation yesterday with 500 people in Latin America who loved to watch soccer. And I asked them, would you go tomorrow if your government says now the economy is open, would you go to a soccer match with 60,000 people sitting next to you? And the answer is no, I'm not going to go there because I don't want to risk myself to get infected. So Going forward, this concept of reopening the economy versus ad an adaptability from organizations to create a new concept of reopening the economy. Uh, I, I want to give a, a few examples of that. A, a lot of restaurants did not have delivery or, or online or pickup services available before. They had to quickly change that to adapt to the new reality. Going forward, even if they want to open up their, their physical locations, they may have to do so with a third of the capacity that, that they used to have before. That is perhaps adapting to what the reopening of the economy will look like going forward. So what do you think will, will the economy and the, 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 operation, the operating models of organization look like going forward? How do you think that will be that would be different from what we had before so that we can consider that we are reopening the economy, taking into account the circumstances that we are, that we were thrown into with the coronavirus. I mean, that's all start. I mean, it's going to really force all the organizations. We talked about some of the sectors that have been heavily impacted, like travel, transportation, hospitality. They're going to start with what the customer wants. If the customer and the public are not ready to go to an urban bank or a restaurant downtown or your sports game in London or South America, those businesses are going to have to either go away, reinvent themselves, drive new revenue streams, new products, new innovation. So really understanding kind of where the psyche of the customer is, is it more business to business sales for a financial services firm that's going to have digital channels and digital commercial businesses? And maybe that's going to stimulate small businesses because they can give them a credit line or take an equity stake. So we're going to have to rethink this, starting with kind of the public and, and the customers, and it's going to be different for the B2B versus the B2C in the companies. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Oh, uh -huh. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Like, I think about Seattle, right? And so Seattle will probably go first in terms of reopening. We're reopening our Prague office in a couple of weeks. Different country, different philosophy, you know, um, different kind of world. But as you think about Seattle, you've got the two biggest employers, Amazon and Microsoft, are still working from home until October. And so when you think about restarting restaurants, you think about restarting all of the other things that support that business, you're not going to start that again until October. That's going to affect, you know, we've, we've reduced our transit, so how people get to other places. So there's a knock-on effect to every other company that's in a place depending on how the big employers are going to play and think about getting people back in. All those sustaining businesses, restaurants, et cetera, that make up those areas are going to depend on when other businesses are opening. So talk about being interconnected. That's another part of it. I, I, I find this question almost unanswerable today. And I think we're all going to have to be, <laughs> seriously, very revisionist and very agile because we don't understand the facts yet. A week yeah. ago, I would say mo many people I talked to were extremely optimistic. Infection rates seemed higher than we thought, therefore mm -hmm. mortality rates were lower. Herd immunity seemed like a very, very plausible uh, outcome. But we didn't know, we we're guessing, we don't have the facts. Yeah. This week we're hearing mutations, uh, increase in death rates, while some states reopen. I don't know whether a month from now everybody in Texas is you know, partying and free because we went back outside and everybody was safe and we loved it, in which case you could imagine a huge boom in getting out in terms of where we're spending. Or two weeks from now, we're saying, oops, shouldn't have opened that quickly. Mm -hmm. 
And coincidentally, that at least here in the United States, I mean, we have a large audience from a lot of countries, but at least here in the United States, there's research that shows that one of the very few things that connect Republicans and Democrats is not reopening the economy as it was before, um, because people are still very scared of just going out to do normal activities because they don't want to get infected. And plus, you know, they don't want to have a $40,000 bill, you know, to get treated in a hospital after, you know, getting infected. So... I, I want to, as we wrap up the conversation, I want to ask, you know, two or three very, very tactical questions. Um, one of them is, I know it's a hard question to, to, to even ask, and is your advice for unemployed people. And I know it's hard because even if we have a vaccine today for coronavirus and we totally reopen the, reopen the economy tomorrow, we won't create 30 plus million jobs overnight. That's not going to happen. And we all know that that's not going to happen. So a lot of these people will continue to be unemployed for the long term. And I don't want to sugarcoat this because I know it's a very, very complicated conversation. Some of them have the means to weather some months, you know, going forward. Other people don't have those means and they are, you know, relying on unemployment benefits and whatnot. But in general, what is your advice for people who are right now unemployed without any clear path of what's going to happen, you know, going forward. I know it's a hard, it's a hard one. Uh, Chris. Reskill. This is, we've known for a long time that we didn't have the right skill mix as an economy. And that means we don't have the right skill mix as individuals. I, uh, um, very, very hard. But we know two things are available right now time, everybody's home, and it's probably easier to learn new skills through variety of low-cost online training and reskilling programs than it's ever been before. And my advice to anybody going through this, including, you know, I've got a son who's graduated from college this spring. How do you find a job in this economy is invest in yourself. And some of those skills, and some of those skills may be things that we didn't think about before. So engineering or trade skills or manufacturing, if we want to manufacture more here and have resilient supply chains. So it's the obvious ones are digital, and, but there, there may be trade skills and we could probably learn something from our friends in Germany and places like that that have probably much better vocational training and apprentice models. So again, this is going to be different for different people in different Does anybody parts know of the US. Not busy? Does anybody know what? A plumber who's not busy. <laughs> yeah. And look, I was going to say the same. I, I, I worked for a company called Service Master. Plumbers, HVAC, those industries um, are good trades, make good money, and are desperate for people. There's just, there hasn't been a resurgence of, of pushing people into some of that work because we've been so hyper-focused on digital. Um, I do think it's going to change the way that we think about, you know, reskilling, et cetera. There are so many people that would love an apprentice. Um, I would look and see what those kinds of programs are. Additionally, I'd also say there are a lot of people with expertise that are giving their time right now, giving free coaching, figuring out what to do. You know, LinkedIn is the place, obviously, that we recommend for everybody to kind of go out and think about those things. Um, but I think for us as an HR community, it's sort of incumbent upon us to give some of our time back. Um, help do a resume review, help, you know, give some coaching, make an introduction. Don't just, you know, look at a resume, introduce somebody to somebody. We do have all these lists, you know, of companies that are looking for folks, figure out how to be, get people connected in. And I guess the last plug I'd say, Enrique, the thing that breaks my heart too, is, is kind of back to Bouchon's point. I see all these kids on LinkedIn and other kids compared to me, but um, that had internships that don't anymore. And so there's some thought that uh, a couple of us have been giving about, you know, do we do sessions on Friday and talk about useful LinkedIn skills, et cetera? You know, how do we connect some of these folks in, in a way where they may not get the paid internship on site like they were hoping for? We're doing ours virtual and we're hoping that it's good and it's a good experience. Um, but I would just say for this community, we have a lot of opportunity to give back. Let's figure out how we do that, even if it's a couple hours of your time and, you know, or if it's just a random, you know, co contact that somebody's making to you, be kind right now. Absolutely. Awesome, Britt. Thank you. Um, I got, I want to ask, as we definitely wrap up the conversation today, I, I, I first of all, I want to say that you are giving so much back already. And I am very appreciative for that and all our community, of course, for all your ideas and insights about 
not only how to weather this crisis, but looking forward, how to get ready for the world post COVID. So thank you so much for, for doing that. And wrapping up this conversation, of course, if you have any final thought, but I want to combine that with a, a final question. If you were to meet with, uh, with CHROs or business leaders and you can tell them the three things that they should be putting their heads on right now, what those three things would be? Mm. I, know, I know last time I asked you questions and I gave you like, you know, like a minute to think about them while I talk to the audience. I'm not giving you the time now. What changed would, in the past I month? Take, I would take a deep breath. And, um, and congratulate yourself on the stuff that you're doing because most of our clients in the HR space are doing a hell of a job dealing with this well-being, dealing with uh, the communications, the some layoffs and furloughs and, and the big challenges on the HR professional. Like the second thing, and we talked about this before, scenario planning on steroids is, is, is the thing today. So every business is dealing with the uncertainty and, and where, where are we with cash flow and liquidity and what does that mean to how many people we can employ? And so forcing yourself into that virtual corner office of your CEO and banging down that door to say, let's talk about the people agenda when we're talking about next year's plan or next year's budget, um, et cetera. Awesome. Absolutely. I would, I would add to that. And it goes back to what Britt was talking about earlier, which is really getting laser focused on the whole well-being experience for people and not just the programmatic approach to it and creating a well-being program, but really thinking about how the decisions you make, the things you say, the, the, the experiences that you create have long-term sustainable positive impacts on the well-being of every single person in your organization. And, and I think a lot of companies we've seen are doing a great job, but there's many, many companies out there who have tremendous opportunity to really put this to the forefront. And, and again, I'm not talking about financial planning and, and things like that. That's important. And, and we need to be doing more of that, especially now. But really looking at how employee well-being is the, the most probably important thing for people right now, because we're going to be forcing employees to make some hard decisions. As we talk about reopening, and I, I like you, Enrique, I, I can't stand that term because we're not opening a door and just letting the, the floodgates go. But individuals are going to have to make decisions on do they go back to work and feel unsafe maybe on you know risk they're they're risk taking risk around it or not having a job as we start to make some of these decisions and so as organizations and CHROs are intimately involved in that design think about how you're going to take care of everybody those who are ready and willing to run back into the office and those who are saying no thank you but I still want to be gainfully employed and make a living we, we have to have a, a much more diverse thought process around that. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. Can I add a couple things? I think infrastructure for CHROs right now is really important. If you have any time, and I know it's been really hard, but your team might kind of as you're thinking about things, if you've still got recruiting teams, put them to work and think about your infrastructure and what you can automate right now. It's not going to get easier. It's going to be busy. So if you have that time to think about your infrastructure, what you can build out, what you can automate in this moment, using some of the staff that may or may not be fully active um, as, as we're kind of in this sort of waiting period to see. Um, I would also say benefits is going to be a really big deal for CHROs in this next cycle of open enrollment. Um, I would suspect that a lot of us are not going to be able to do all the programs that we were hoping to do. We probably put some things in place that we were excited about to get us through this moment. And probably everything we're going to be allowed to spend as HR leaders is probably going to be related to return to office or making sure we're keeping everybody to the best of our ability kind of calm and, 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 and focused. Uh, I just think the benefits piece is going to get super complicated too because when we reopen, whatever we reopen, um, a lot of those expenses haven't hit your budget. And if you are self-insured, if you're thinking about things, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what the costing and everything else is going to be for us as we go through this next open enrollment. I think you should be scenario planning with your brokers or whoever they are now, because I think that is going to be very different than you expect. Thank you, Britt. Chris? Boy, I agree with everything that's been said, including the huge, you know, kudos and thanks that we all owe to the, the CHRO and HR communities for taking care of all of our people during this important time. Let me add to it by, by, by making a different point, though. Um, we're stuck as CHRO community with the facts that CEOs think uh, HR is the most critically important function 
but as a rule, they're, they're dissatisfied with the support they get. The biggest disconnect across all function. As we return, and I, I want to point out that lots of people have been going to work all through this, so I, I, none of yeah. us can quite figure out what the right language is. Um, we've gotten through this um, by focusing on questions of identity. You know, who, what's our purpose as companies? What are our values? What are our culture? Who do we stand for? I think CHROs have a major moment in the next year or so as we get through this, which is to shift the focus from there to the operating model. Mm. And I would challenge you, I often say to some of my CHRO clients, your challenge is to go from the topic at the end of the board meeting to the middle of the board meeting. And if you aren't tackling how you flatten your structure today, how you speed up, how main, you know, speed up or maintain the speed and quality of decision making without bureaucracy and hierarchy that's happened during this crisis, and how you don't more directly connect talent to value and make it easier for people to do and succeed in your jobs, you might be missing a once in a lifetime opportunity. That is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that, Chris. And. Uh, Thank you so much for being with us today. I think maybe next one we're going to do it in a couple of months from now. I'm hoping that we are finding this, uh, you know, we should do it as a social happy hour, right? Just, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, uh, hey, Chris, hey, yeah. I mean, maybe we do it as a, as a happy hour and we continue to chat about this. I think this is a fantastic conversation that will continue to be uh, evolving uh, over time because things are changing so fast. So, uh, you know, thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, uh, Lisa, Braid, Chris, Bushan. For the audience that uh, who has been watching us, thank you so much once again. I know there's a lot of stuff in there. I'm going to tag Braid, Chris, Bushan, and Lisa on the chat in case they have. Uh, I know they are very busy, but if they you have any time available sometime soon you know, to check out all the comments, because there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And I, out of all the things that, uh, the very important things of this conversation, I want to rescue one, one, one thing that has become way more important these days than, 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 it, than it already was before. And it's this idea of, of being human and treating people with love. I think this is a hard, hard time for everybody, even those who seemingly are doing well, you know, they have to make tough choices to continue to do well, if you will. And those tough choices are not even easy for anybody. I don't think, you know, laying off 25% of a workforce in Airbnb was easy for the CEO. It's not easy for anybody. So everybody's going through some level of pain and some level of suffering, which is different from somebody else. But this is a hard time for everybody. And if we find a way, like we said in this panel, to, to make those tough choices that we're going to need to make to continue uh, keeping our companies operating, but we do so with love and with, with kindness, kindness and, and, and understanding and humanity, I think we're going to be in a much better place than if we do that, uh, you know, in an inhuman way, if you will. So if you are in a, in a, I've been saying, you know, nurses, paramedics, doctors, firefighters, military, they are in the front line of the battleground, keeping us protected from the coronavirus. But HR people are in the business battleground trying to make the best uh, decisions given the very difficult circumstances. So kudos to you for doing that. And please continue to do that with love and with care and understanding. So thank you, everybody. Please stay safe. Uh, thank you to this panel. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks.